Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk. So um, this talk is going to be kind of a bit of a mix. Um, clinical pathologists love hands on slides. We love to look at slides. So you're going to get to look at some digital images, which we'll provide to you as um, hopefully they're huge files. They're like 180 megabytes a piece. Um, we'll hopefully provide to you as part of this conference and you can download the free software and there are instructions for downloading the software to view it. Unfortunately, I'm a Mac girl and it doesn't work on the Mac, which is annoying, but, um, but most people are PC people. So for me, blood is the window into the animal. Animals can't speak for themselves, so we let their blood do the talking for them. And so really what we need is to get the best quality blood smears so that we can learn the most from what their blood is trying to tell us. Okay, so the outline of this talk is just basic principles of blood collection, and obviously we all know that for hematology, we're gonna collect blood into a purple topo EDTA tube. And then I'm gonna go through techniques for blood smear preparation because really making a good quality blood smear is key to interpreting and seeing all the findings that you should be seeing. And then I'm gonna go through a really systematic way of how we clinical pathologists look at a blood smear and how we teach our residents to look at blood smears. And then just a co uh, com common things to look out for which can really trick you. And, and I call this telling fact from fiction. And I actually think this is one of the hardest things that we do as a clinical pathologist is knowing what to ignore and what that we need to pay attention to, which takes time and practice. Okay, so why we're we looking at a blood smear? Well, as I said, it's the animal speaking for itself but um, we can tell if there's an anemia and the cause of the anemia, um, such as this cat here, which has an oxygen-induced hemolytic anemia with the centrocytes, which are these red cell shapes right here, and the Heinz bodies, which we all know some cats can have normally without any evidence of anemia, but these are pretty huge. And this is a cat with acetaminophen toxicosis. Um, we can see evidence of inflammation, um, neoplasia, and actually I collected blood samples of the shelter medicine crew collected blood samples from cats for me from the shelter for our reference intervals now probably 10 to 12 years ago, maybe coming up again unfortunately because it's a lot of work. Um, and uh, I found a cat with leukemia as a clinically healthy cat apparently, but that was had a leukemia. So. Um, you will see these occasionally through the shelter. Luckily now with feline leukemia virus, kind of not as prevalent as it used to be where um, we don't see these frequently. I mean, we like seeing them, but it's not good for the animal, of course. Don't let your clinical pathologist get excited about something in a blood smear. It's usually not good for the animal. Um, this is an infectious agent, Babesia canis. Haven't been seeing really too much of this up here, but we certainly see Babesia gibsoni, and we're starting to see those lovely tick-borne diseases with global warming. So we can certainly look for infectious agents. So um, the main thing is to always do everything with fresh blood. So the minute you get the blood, seriously, just make a blood smear. It's really easy to do. I'm gonna walk you through our technique and just some tips to help you make a really good quality blood smear. And why do we emphasize this is because you get artificial changes that occur with storage. And this can start occurring within about four hours of collection and is gonna be accelerated um, if you keep the blood um, in your pocket close to your body or um, so you wanna keep the blood obviously at four degrees Celsius. So what we're seeing here is a fresh blood smear and this um, animal and it is another cat has an inflammatory leukogram because there is um, a band neutrophil here and here's a seg and here's some lymphoid cells. And this is actually a cat with leukemia because these are a neoplastic lymphocytes. Um, but here, this is the blood that we um, got smears of, but the veterinarian had prep smears, which made our lives a lot easier because here is what I would call um, a false band. It could be a real band without having seen that in the fresh smear. I would be reluctant to say this is a true band. Plus you now have Dole bodies forming, which so you get even toxic change forming in all blood smears. So always make a blood smear. And here you have cells that are dead, cells that are ruptured and cells that I would have a real problem identifying. And so we would have had a lot of trouble making a diagnosis of leukemia with secondary inflammation in this cat um, without having a fresh blood smear that the vet sent to us. 
The other things that we see are dead and dying cells. This is an apoptotic cell. I have no idea what that was. I can guess it was probably a neutrophil in its previous life. And that's because it's got neutrophil looking granules, but it's, you know, who knows what it is. These are frequently mistaken for nucleated red cells when they just have a pycnotic nucleus. Um, and of course, we have a kind of site formation, and this is blood smear from a dog, and this, this can occur pretty quickly. Again, definitely within 24 hours, you start seeing those changes and accelerated at, um, if the blood's not kept at four degrees. Okay, so good hematologic technique. It's all about making a good quality blood smear. So um, I, we usually use a microhematocrit tube. Um, versus a pasture pipette that I'm showing here because um, then you can really control the size of the drop in. It's all about the size of the drop and being comfortable and the thing is glass slides are cheap, relatively, practice, practice, practice until you get it and once you get it you will always have it. Hopefully it's like riding a bike, um, so they tell me because I don't ride a bike very well. but um, Really once we tell you the tricks of the trade of making a good smear um, you can really do it and it's practicing. So this is actually on our website, which is here. So you can access this at any time and you can see instructions that are written. But essentially you want to put a drop of the smear near the frosted end and, end. <clears throat> and how um, this, and this uh, illustration of the person holding the blood smear at that very end is critical because you want to get your hands out of the way, but you also want to stabilize that blood smear that you're making the smear on. And you can see that the hand here is really out of the way of the spreader hand. You put the blood, um, the spreader slide in front of the drop. You pull it back into the drop so that it spreads nicely along the edge of that spreader slide. And then with the smooth, confident, firm stroke, you go forward. And um, you create a beautiful looking smear just like this. Um, and we would do that probably eight out of 10 times and two times we're not that happy and would redo really it again. Well, probably one time out of 10. Um, and you would need a practice to get this, but this is a really beautiful slide because the feathered edge is uh, three quarters of the way along the slide. So if you send it to us, we have an automated stainer and um, it won't stain anything there or there. So it's really nice if the entire smear is in the first two thirds of that glass um, beyond the frosted edge, which is right here. So what are the things that I see people doing? I see sometimes people holding it, and this is how I used to do it till the techs in the lab taught me how to do this better. And I used to hold um, with my hand like that on that edge, and I would come towards my hand. I go, oh my God, I'm going to hit my hand and hurt myself, so I'm going to lift up. And lifting up is not a good idea. So this way, you can keep going all the way and just keep heading off the edge of the slide. And that means you don't lift up because lifting up means you don't get a feathered edge. The other thing that is key is this angle. This angle is really important. So that's about a 45 degree angle roughly to the slide. <clears throat> that's really key. If you increase your angle, you make a shorter slide. If you decrease your angle, you make a longer slide. So we're pretty much 45, 45, 45. And you want to maintain that 45 degree angle the entire way you go across the smear. So what I see particularly students doing is they start off great and then they go like that as they go along and that's actually going to make a really long slide. So um, keep that angle and really smooth motion and even contact. So I like to say it's contact. You don't want to be pressing down with that spreader slide. You just want to be contacting. You want to feel a glass contacting from the spreader slide as well as your blood smear slide. And really, if you follow those tips and you don't make too big a drop of blood, you want a drop of blood that's around um, five millimeters um, wide, um, just like a small drop of blood. If you have a huge drop of blood, which you obviously will get often with a pasture pipette, um, it's going to be too big to handle. You're going to go way off the edge of the, sm of the slide because it's going to be too much blood. And if you have too little blood, that can also really affect your results because you may start to make the wrong decisions about is this animal anemic? Is this animal got a normal Y count? What the platelet count? And I, we can actually look at a blood smear and go, okay, there's way too little blood here. And I've just got this blood smear exam. I don't have counts because we just have the smear, all bets are off. I, I'm not going to even estimate anything. And we provide estimates if we just have a blood smear of pretty much everything. 
and really just practice. Glass slides are cheap. Also, you want clean, good quality glass slides. If you pick them out of that box and they're all stuck together and you're scrooching them apart and you're putting your hands all over them, avoid your hands, they're greasy. Um, and that really impacts how you can make a good blood smear. So get clean slides. I wipe slides on my clothing. Hopefully it's clean. I haven't seen my horse that morning. So um, essentially nice clean slides, free of lint, and just make everything easy for you to make a blood smear. You want good equipment. And if it doesn't work, you can always blame the glass slides. Okay, then the next key is you made a good quality slide. You need to stain it. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about staining in the hematology lecture, but most of you in the cytology lecture, but most of you work with Diffquick, right? You usually use Diffquick. Any other rapid stains you guys use? No. So most of the, the slides I'm going to show you here are unfortunately our right stain, which is very different from Diffquick. And I was looking yesterday for Diffquick blood smears images, and I'm going to take some because we didn't have any, because it does make it a little more challenging. But essentially, once you've stained the slide, you want to develop a systematic way of approaching the slide so you don't miss anything. And you want to be thorough and you want to be consistent. And the very first thing you do is you check the quality of the smear. So these are some images of the Hall of Shame, which are slides that we've received at Cornell. And um, so you guys aren't going to make a slide that looks like that, OK? OK, we do have kind of a tempt at a feathered edge, but it's hitting the frosted edge here. And this is really, really, really thick. So this is going to be really hard for me to find even a thin area for me to look at where I can actually see what's going on. So this slide would be tough for even us to examine. This slide, someone tried twice on the exact same slide. And, you know, but this one we can deal with. We can go right there is where I go, or maybe right here where it's thin enough to deal with. And you can see this was just a huge drop of blood that they put on that slide. And of course, that's perfect, which is what our techs make in the lab. OK, so then what I do is at low power, um, I look at the quality of the stain, because this is your chance to make it a better stain if it's not quite right. So the red cells should be red. And I like to see the white cells popping out at me. So you can kind of see their nuclei because they're purple versus red on over here. And um, diff quick, they're not going to pop as much, but you should still see them pretty easily. So if it's if the red cells are too blue, it's going to be really hard to see those white cells. Um, and if it's understained, you're not going to see very much at all. So um, look at 10x, and then you can fiddle with the stain to make it bluer or maybe a little more red if you can. Usually with DiffQuick, um, if you've overstained it, you're done, essentially. So make more than one slide, and you can stain up another one. So also know the limitations and also the virtues of your stain. You know, clinical pathologists and academics hate DiffQuick, and there's a variety of reasons for it. But DiffQuick has its virtues. They're just few in number. Um, so DiffQuick tend to, tends to make nucleoli more prominent than they should be, so you can be misled. We like a lot of colors. We like our purples. We like our magentas. We like our pinks. We red. And we like to kind of demonstrate all those colors in our write-ups. But DiffQuick's kind of purple and purple. It's light purple, dark purple. So that kind of makes it a little more challenging. Um, we really look for a chromatin pattern, um, looking for neoplastic cells in blood, as well as in cytology. And DiffQuick kind of ruins our chromatin pattern, so it makes it tough. As you all know, it will not stain up mast cell granules. And I'll come back to that in a sec. And lymphocyte granules. And this is actually a granular lymphocyte in a cat. If I see this in blood, it means it's got lymphoma. This particular lymphocyte, there are others that doesn't mean that. But this particular one means it has lymphoma. And unfortunately, these granules are just like mast cell granules. They do not stain with DiffQuick. So you can miss this diagnosis. It's a particular nasty, nasty lymphoma. And we can actually give you a clue from blood that it's there if we see these cells. But DiffQuick is actually awesome for distemper inclusions, which hopefully you guys won't see too much, but potentially could. And this is our lovely stain, our right stain here. And there's this really pale inclusion here, and there's another pale inclusion here, but you're kind of guessing. Um, whereas you put on DiffQuick, and you can see these lovely pink inclusions in these red cells there and there, and in these neutrophils, there's actually a couple of them. So if we get a history of a suspect distemper, we DiffQuick it, because we have DiffQuick in the lab. 
And then at a 10x power view, you want to check the feathered edge. And I'll tell you why you're checking the feathered edge. And right here is the feathered edge. And what I do is um, I check that entire feather, except I usually start here. And then I go there and then I have to go back, which is kind of annoying, but it's just the way I do things. I've been doing this for God knows how many years, too many. And I still start here versus over there for some reason. I like to find the tip of that feathered edge to start the blood smear. So what are we looking at the feathered edge? We're looking for platelet clumps. And this is the platelet clumps, which we see all the time in cats, as you know. Um, this is also in this pale fibrillar material, which is actually fibrin. And sometimes this fibrin can mimic a platelet clump. So you actually think it's a platelet clump from high power, but it's not. And as you know, platelet clumps are going to affect our estimate of the platelet count. Um, and we obviously are going to look for thrombocytopenia when we're looking um, and estimating platelets from a blood smear when we're looking at a smear. You get, will see microfilaria out there, and microfilaria are usually just behind the feathered edge, actually, rather than at the feathered edge, particularly when they're low in number. We can also see other infectious agents, such as some of these uh, uh, protozoal diseases that we don't tend to see up here so much, um, out in leukocytes in the feathered edge. So we always train our residents to actually look within the cells at the feathered edge, not just um, at 10x. We're also looking for large things. So we often see reactive lymphocytes, which we get to review. Um, if I take, see some big blue cells, they'll give it to us to review to make a decision as to what they are. And this is a neoplastic red blood cell in a feathered edge of a cat with feline leukemia virus infection. Um, we see other neoplastic cells, such as acute leukemia cells or lymphoma that may be out there. We can see megakaryocytes out there. The first time I saw it, I was like, oh my God, what's that big cell? This is disease. And then I'm like, oh God, you're an idiot. It's a megakaryocyte. And that's just normal and that's fine. But it's like this huge multi-lobulated cell. And you're like, oh my God, it has to be cancer. And it's not. And then we can see uh, macrophages, which we call histiocytes, and this one's erythrophagocytic. Um, they're not always erythrophagocytic, but this was a dog with immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, so you can see these. We also see these circulating in dogs with histiocytic sarcoma, um, but they're usually more reactive than neoplastic. And of course, we see mast cells, and these are the variants of mast cells that we can see at the feathered edge. See it more commonly in animals with inflammation or cancer than we see it in animals, and not necessarily mast cell tumors. Um, dogs with allergic skin disease can get it. Cats usually means neoplasia, but not always. Whereas the dog, I usually think of non-neoplasia before I think of neoplasia when I see mast cells in blood. So then you find the monolayer, <clears throat> and the monolayer is going to depend on the amount of crude. If the animal is anemic, you're going to make a longer smear. If the animal is polycythemic, the smear is going to be shorter. But essentially, the monolayer is usually one or two fields back from the feathered edge, and that really is the monolayer area right there before it starts to get too thick. And what you want to see is you want to see the red cells disperse very nicely, and if the animal's anemic, they're going to be way more dispersed than this. And you want to be able to see the leukocytes really nicely spread so you can identify them very easily. And that's a neutrophil and that's a monocyte just by um, a quick look. So it's really nice. You can see platelets and everything's there. And this is blood smear from a dog because it's got central pallor. Um, this is too close to the feathered edge, so it's too thin. And what the cells do there, they distort very easily, so they're hard to identify. And this is way too thick where who the hell knows what these cells are. You just, you know, you're going to be making your life difficult. If you look there, and that's one of the biggest mistakes students make when they first start looking at blood smears, they're always like way too far back. So they ask us what the cell is, and we're like, nah, we don't know. Now nah, you need to be here. And they're like, oh my god, look, I can see. So that makes um, a big difference. So um, then we go, once we found the monolayer, um, I actually scan the slide. And I've learned, how to, I've learned to do this over the years. I scan just to kind of look for things that shouldn't be there. And I found neoplastic cells just on scanning that aren't at the feathered edge. I found mast cells just on scanning. I found other cells that I kind of want to take a closer look at. So I kind of just do a quick scan before I just jump down at the feathered edge. Um, but then what, I, what you do is once you've found the monolayer and you've done your scan, then um, we have 50 oil immersion, which I love to death, um, or 100 oil for the fine detail. But if you don't have oil, you can use 40x, but you are going to miss stuff at 40. Um, and you need to add a cover slip if you're looking at um, using a 40x lens. 
So what do we look at at high power? Well, we've got all those cells to look at. We've got white cells, including doing a differential cell count. And this is kind of how I tend to do it. Um, you can go uh, back and forth like that. In the monolayer, this is getting a little too thick here. But you can just figure out a system. I usually go there, 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 there. That's just me, but there's no one perfect way to do it. Find a technique that works for you. Um, we do a 200 cell diff if there's more than 20 to 30,000, 30, I think it's 30,000 cells in blood. And obviously if you have a very leukopenic animal, you're gonna be struggling to reach 100 cells. And you won't be in the monolayer either. You'll have to review the whole slide. And then we look in detail at their features and I'm gonna just highlight a couple of things that we look for. Red blood cells, obviously we're looking at their features and platelets number and morphologic features. But what we also do from 10X is we estimate a Y count and um, there are formula that don't always work that great. So we just teach our residents to estimate Y counts by looking at the feather, by looking at the body of the smear. And um, you can only estimate a Y count if there's no leukocyte clumping and if there's even distribution of the cells in the smear. So if they're all at the feather and there's none in the body, then all bets are off. But um, we do this because we occasionally get samples where the sample's clotted and we're trying to give the vet the most information that we can. So we'll estimate a white count, um, estimate um, whether the animal's anemic or not based on the density of red cells in the monolayer, and also estimate a platelet count. And of course, if you make a thin blood smear from too little blood, all those estimates are going to be way off. Okay, so what are we looking for? Um, with the leukocytes, we're obviously looking for a left shift, and this is blood from a cab with a severe inflammatory leukogram. This is a, a neutrophil because it's nice and segmented, but it's got toxic change, which is diffuse cytoplasmic basophilia, as well as um, this indistinct vacuolation. This is a beautiful band with lovely toxic change, including way too blue of a cytoplasm in these dole bodies. And this is between a band and a seg, so this here is uh, more of a band in here, but it's too constricted, so greater than 50% constriction is what we call a seg. There's always going to be subjectivity, but I think we'd all recognize that this cat is um, got pretty toxic neutrophils. This would be moderate to severe for us, and it's got a left shift, so we'd all interpret this as an inflammatory leukogram, whether we get 10 bands and you get 15 it's not going to make a huge difference as long as you recognize those key features of inflammation. And certainly you are going to be looking for that in shelters if you have sick animals. You're going to be wanting to identify bands and you're going to be wanting to look for uh, toxic change. If you think you're seeing severe toxic change, you should have a, a pretty decent left shift. Mild toxic change, particularly cats, can have a couple of delay bodies even when they're healthy. So we let them have a couple of dole bodies. So if you're seeing what you think is toxic change without a left shift, you're probably not seeing toxic change. That's kind of our general rule. You can, however, see a left shift with no toxic change. Okay? So, and every rule is made to be broken. So we also see some big blue cells, and then the question is, um, are they reactive lymphocytes, or are they neoplastic cells? And neoplastic cells could be myeloid or lymphoid in origin. So we just give them a, a generic term of blasts if we see them. And essentially, this just um, is a compilation of images from three patients with leukemia and three patients with reactive lymphocytes. And this is just to show how difficult it is to distinguish between them. And because I took the pictures, I know what they are. So that's um, what they ended up being um, in these animals. But you can actually see reactive lymphocytes alongside neoplastic cells in blood. So you can actually see both of them in the same sample. And this is probably one of the hardest distinctions you have to make. Um, and I would recommend you always verify what you think because this could be the life or death of an animal if you're going to call a cancer, particularly metapoietic neoplasia such as acute leukemia. You don't want to be misdiagnosing that. Then obviously we're going to look for inclusions such as infectious agents and we're definitely seeing way more of this. This is anaplasma phagocytophilum. This is actually in a horse, but we're starting to see this more in dogs. And in the dog, this could be um, a lichia ewing eye or anaplasma phagocytophilum, which is now um, the Elikia Ewing eye is um, picked up on the 40X plus 
but not the old 40X text. And uh, associated hematologic findings, the most common hematologic finding you're going to have is, is thrombocytopenia. Um, and maybe anemia, but thrombocytopenia is pretty classic for these infectious agents. Other infectious, other things that we see are um, infectious agents obviously on mycoplasma and hemophilus, um, which we all know what it looks like. Um, you can see abnormal granulations, and this is uh, blood from a Berman cat, and you can see these lovely pink granules in here. Um, granules could be a whole variety of things. They could be mast cell granules in an animal undergoing acute anaphylaxis. They could be a storage disease, which is incredibly rare if you think you see it, send it to me because they're always fun. Um, this is actually an inherited abnormality in these cats, and it mimics toxic change, but it is of no known pathologic relevance. It's just kind of cool. And then we can see, as you saw, erythrophages and actually hemocytorin within neutrophils and macrophages in blood or monocytes of blood in an immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, usually when it's intravascular hemolysis. So what do we look for in red cells? I can give an entire lecture on just each of these topics, so this is just a really brief overview. Um, so the very first question I ask our residents is if they say there's an anemia, the next question is, is it regenerative or not? So what are we looking for with regenerative anemia? And you can start of getting a feel for this at 10x. We look for polychromasia in particular because you can see nucleated red cells in animals with heat stroke um, where there is no regeneration there. Um, you can see how jolly bodies in um, animals with a whole variety of conditions, splenic dysfunction, corticosteroid therapy. Um, we obviously look for nisocytosis because immature red blood cells are bigger than normal red cells. And you may see basophilic stippling, which we also know can be seen in dogs with lead poisoning as well as nucleated reds that are disproportionate to the degree of polychromasian anemia. And this is an anemic dog, um, and these are polychromatophils here, here, and here. And then you've got to say, are there enough polychromatophils for the degree of anemia to make this a regenerative anemia? And in this dog, it's got plenty, even though it's pretty severely anemic, as you can see by all the white space between the cells. Um, there's at least um, 8 to 10 percent polychromatophils, which would be a roughly an 8 to 10 percent retic count. And so this dog would be uh, regenerative anemia. He has a beautiful band. He has a sag and a sag. Um, then we look for abnormalities in shape, and you can see some keratocytes here. And um, schistocytes, actually it's more of a schistocyte than a keratocyte. He has a schistocyte there too. And there's a how jolly body on that cell there. And so um, the next thing I'm going to say, okay, if the animal's an anemia and it's regenerative, can I identify a cause on this blood smear so that I can tell a clinician what's going on? And unfortunately, in this case, I can just see some fragmentation. So I'd be worried about potentially concurrent DRC or vasculitis. But this is pretty nonspecific, so I can't give a specific diagnosis. And this actually was just a dog with a blood loss anemia um, because of being hit by a car. So... Actually, it didn't, I wouldn't have seen anything. And of course, we can't tell if the dog's bleeding from a blood smear, but you can tell by looking at it. We look for abnormal color, which is hyperchromasia for iron deficiency. And obviously, we look for inclusions and infectious agents, Heinz bodies, anything like that. So platelets, um, what we do in the monolayer of the smear, to estimate it, you need a 100x all immersion field. You can probably do it at 40, but we never do it on 40 because um, truly identifying platelets can be tough just at 40. And one platelet per uh, 100x all immersion field is equivalent to 15,000 per microliter. So if you're seeing one platelet per field in a dog, it's a severe thrombocytopenia. Two would be 30,000, one's 15. And if you're not seeing any, and there's none out at the feathered edge, then you've got a pretty severe thrombocytopenia, as long as you don't have any and the sample wasn't partially clotted. So these are just different um, samples from um, different animals. This is a dog here. This is a cat with a really huge platelet, which normally cats have big platelets just to make our lives more challenging. And here's a lovely fibrin clump, which can look like degranulated platelets. And of course, we look for inclusions in these, and this is actually an, an animal with anaplasma platus, which is an alichia that, um, or bacteria that infects platelets and causes a thrombocytopenia. You can see this is a dog and that some of the platelets are huge, and that is a suggestion that the animal is, is potentially producing more platelets. So big platelets are like big purple red cells. They're like polychromatophils. 
they usually mean a regenerative response, but they can also mean abnormal platelet production. So there's something wrong with it, even as so it's not necessarily a regenerative response to a thrombocytopenia, it could be an a, a platelet abnormality, so myelodysplastic syndrome or leukemia. And the Cavalier King Charles Spaniels have lovely big platelets because of a tubulin defect, so de defective production. So then we want to tell fact from fiction, and this is um, some of the hardest things that we have, to, we have to deal with. So you're not going to make your life easy if you've under or overstained the slide because it's going to be really hard to see things that you need to see. Stain precipitate looks like uh, bacteria, particularly mycoplasma hemophilus, and this is a huge chunk of it. So we're all going to say that's way too many cells to be mycoplasma. But, you know, for some reason, I don't know if you guys have seen this, stain precipitate hangs around the edges of the red cells, likes to do that, so it likes to mimic uh, mycoplasma. So it's kind of irritating. This was um, bacteria that was actually in the Difquick stain. If you're seeing a bacteremia, the animal should have a severe inflammatory leukogram and trying to die in front of you. So if you don't have a severely sick animal and inflammatory leukogram and you see bacteria, you've probably added it there. Um, so keep your stains pretty clean. Um, water artifact is the most challenging, and this is uh, blood from a cat. And look at these things on the edges of the red cells. This is all water artifact. This cat did not have mycoplasma hemophilus. It's a little bit more refractile than mycoplasma. And every time a clinician's come down and said, I think there's mycoplasma, it's usually been either stain precipitate or water artifact. And of course, you can now do PCR, which is great. But you know, in the old days, um, you just relied on. And then for us, we have issues if there's too much EDTA or those cats that you can't get blood from. It tends to cause um, artifacts in our results that we send out because it causes changes in the red cell volume. <clears throat> Some artifacts we can't do anything about, those we can do things about. Um, the artifacts we can't do anything about is taking is an animal that's lipemic because of disease, it distorts the red cells and you get rupturing of the white cells. And um, intravascular hemolysis, this actually is an artifact that happened. This blood was mailed in um, during a real cold winter. I think it was below freezing for two weeks here in Ithaca. And the blood froze in transit, and that's kind of what happened to all the red cells. So those are really difficult um, to examine because these are all ruptured red cells, and there's a platelet here. And even the leukocytes tend to get a bit trashed. Okay, so those are just some useful resources. We're revamping our uh, ClinPath teaching site and it's going to launch in August 2014. It's eclinpath.com, so easy to see it, where we have a lot of this information. And then um, on our website with the Animal Health Diagnostic Center, we have all the things I pretty much told you about making a blood smear as well as that image. Okay, so I'm going to now go over some digital slides and we're going to look and then try and figure out what's going on with these animals. So this is going to be a question and answer type session. So there's quite a few uh, white cells in here. So there, 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 there. For me, that's quite a lot of white cells. So if I was estimating a count in a cat, I would say this is probably mildly increased. It's not 50 or 60,000. It's not huge, right? But if this is the monolayer of the smear, it seems to be mildly increased. Um, there's a little bit more white space in here than I would like, so I'd be wondering if the animal's mildly anemic. Um, and now, obviously, when I look at a blood smear, I look at it blinded. In other words, I don't look at the counts or anything first. And I make all these assessments, and then we look at and see if everything matches. And if it doesn't match, we go back and double check. It's a way to teach yourself. It's also a way of um, not focusing on something and missing something else, which I've certainly done, so I try and learn from my mistakes. So I would have estimated a high Y count through there and maybe a mild anemia. Platelets, I have no idea from this angle. Okay, so that's a 10x view. So a 10x view we want to find um, near to the feathered edge. So this is getting to the feathered edge because I can see more white space. So there's a nice big hole that I want to avoid there. So we're going to come down here. I think you can, and you can zoom in by just clicking and by just holding the mouse down and going in, or you can use this button, and you can see how in the lower right-hand corner there's a magnified image. Okay, so let's go and look around, and let's do some cell ID. Oh, I don't want to move in. I want to move up. Can move, oops, too far out. Okay, so what do you guys think this particular cell is right here? 
So is it neutrophil or monocyte? I'll help you out. Neutrophil, great. And is it a band or is it a sag? Okay, so I'm a herd band and I heard sag. So this is one that's in between. For me, this is like 50% uh, constricted here compared to that bulbous end, but it's got a pretty smooth outline depending on my mood on the day, honestly. Um, you could call it a seg or you could call it a band, but I would probably call it a seg because it's 50% constricted, um, more than 50% narrower here than it is on the edges, but it's got a pretty smooth outline. Well, it's starting to ruffle a little bit, so yeah, I'd definitely call that a seg. See how we have these little internal fights with each other? And, you know, I'm signing this out, so I'm responsible, so it's my call regardless. So what do you think about, is there any other abnormalities in the cell that you're worried about, or is this a happy, healthy, neutrophil slash band? Think it's toxic? Yes, and I would agree with it. You, it is toxic. There is lovely... Um, Dole bodies right here, there's cytoplasmic basophilia, which is the streaky blue stuff. And see these indistinct vacuoles? It's kind of rarefraction in the cytoplasm, that's toxic change. So what one cell, I guess I know you never make a diagnosis of one cell, but this is a pretty, pretty severely toxic neutrophil. So what do you think's going on with this cat? As far as white cells go. Great. Left shift and toxic change, so what's the process that we now learn about? So what's going on in the cat? What does left shift and toxic change tell us? Inflammation, so you're gonna go and look for a source of inflammation, right? And here is another beautiful, this is actually um, between a band and a metamyelocyte because it's looking almost reniform shaped, beautiful toxic neutrophil. Okay, so what's this over here? Anyone know what these are over here? Okay, what's that there? And then that is a clump of platelets, right? So you can get platelet clumping not only at the feathered edge, but also in the body of the smear. And if you estimate the platelet count here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's a bit low for a cat, right? Eight, 000, eight in... Um, 100 all X immersion field is going to be 100, under 150,000. That's because I can multiply 15 by 10. So 8 is about 120,000, which means this cat is, could be thrombocytopenic if there were no clumps at the edge. But, you know, these clumps make it difficult to estimate a count um, when they're in the body of the smear. So that's why you don't only look at one, one section. You want to look at others. Here's another beautiful toxic band, and you can see lovely dole bodies. What's the cell here? So that's a normal red cell there. So this is more purple and slightly bigger. So that's a... And so if I said this cat was mildly anemic, would you say it's a trying to regenerate? Yeah, absolutely. We've got echinocytes. We've got what we call echinoleptocytes, which are oval-shaped echinocytic cells. See that with liver disease, but not only liver disease. So this cat has a nice inflammatory leukogram. He's got some poikilocytosis. I'm not really seeing anything else. I did see one other finding in his blood smear. Um, and you can see as I'm scouting around, um, whoops, and I went too far over there, that um, there's really not a lot of platelets in each of these fields. So this cat is mildly thrombocytopenic. So, um, here's a macrocyte, which probably corresponds to a punctate reticulocyte, so also an immature cell. Here's a lovely toxic seg. And let's just zoom out and see if I can find something other than a seg. Yep, I can. So let's zoom in on that cell. So those are also toxic neutrophils there and there. And this cell is an entirely different cell and it's looking kind of funky, and that's a monocyte over there because it's a different cell, um, but that's not an easy monocyte. This here is a toxic metamyelocyte, so the left shift's extending all the way. Anyone know what this cell is? Round nucleus, small amount of blue cytoplasm. Lymphocyte, great. And band, band, let's see what else there is in here. And there's, looks, another toxic band, beautiful toxic band. This cat actually had way more bands than SEG. So it had a degenerative left shift 
because there were more bands than sags and I need to okay so what's that cell there dark really dark pycnotic nucleus and kind of reddish purple cytoplasm Nucleated red, yeah, you guys rock. So could be part of the regenerative response, but cats throw nucleated reds out when they feel like it. And the inflammation could be enough to do nucleated reds out. So now I'm in a bit thicker area of the smear and you can see the red cells stacking up on each other. That's through low formation. Um, it's normal for cat blood. It could be excessive in this cat. Um, I think it looks okay. Um, but if it was um, present and we did call it, it would indicate high globulins, which would not be surprising considering this cat has an inflammatory leukogram. So what did Kira have wrong with her? Um, that's Molly, which we'll do next. So Kira had, oh yeah, she was a surgical case and this was done post-surgery. She did well after initial surgery for a foreign body. Um, she did well initially, and then two days after surgery, she spiked a fever and was looking depressed. And they tapped her fluid, her abdominal fluid, because she had ascites, she had a septic peritonitis. They went back in, found devitalized bowel, and she did great after the second surgery. So the inflammatory leukogram really told them there's a serious issue here, as did the septic peritonitis. But that was the first thing they would have looked at, and they would have probably statted this blood smear. So um, that tells us, look for a source of inflammation, which was her with devitalized gut. How much time do I have? About five minutes. Five minutes. Do you want me to do another case in five minutes, or do you have any questions about that case? Another case? Okay. Yep. <coughs> so there's three cases that we guys are going to give you once Kira. And again, you can look at it, and I will send you the case information on these. Um, so that you have it close. Why are you not closing now? Not responding. Oh, you got to love this. Close the program. Don't cancel. I don't want you to check it. Thank you for kindly. Go away, Molly. Okay, so Molly is a dog. <coughs> so here's a feathered edge. It's not the greatest feathered edge because it's kind of this raggedy feathered edge. So we would have to go up and down, up and down. But we would have really scanned the feathered edge and looked for anything that we saw there. So let's go back and this is where the monolay is. So just from there, do you think Molly's anemic or not? So if this is, actually we're pretty high up. So this is a 10x view. So do you think Molly's anemic? Yeah, and pretty severe anemia, right? Because there's an awful lot of white space. So next question, do you think Molly is regenerating? This is 40X view. Do you see, yeah, great. Do you see beautiful polychromasia? And there's quite a lot of it. So she has a regenerative anemia. Now the next question is, can we identify a cause? So now we're gonna look at the red cells and start to see, are there any abnormalities other than these polychromatophils? Spherocytes, yeah, I heard it. Great, beautiful, small round cells and tons of them. So these are spherocytes and there are a lot of them and a lot of spherocytes give you the diagnosis of IMHA. Now a few spherocytes does not mean IMHA, but a lot, it's IMHA to proven otherwise. Now we haven't finished with Molly. There are quite a few other abnormalities in her. So what are these cells here? Anyone know what these are there? Okay, so Molly had brown urine. So what do you think is going on with her? Intravascular hemolysis. So these ghost cells support it. Now you're going to see ghost cells in almost every blood smear you make just out of artifact. But when they're this many, plus her plasma, when you spin that down and you look for a nematocrit or a piece pack cell volume, it's going to be red plasma. So the brown urine presumptive hemoglobin urine until proven otherwise. So obviously we all know intravascular hemolysis is a poor prognostic indicator. And I wonder if Molly was a cocker spaniel because they love to intravascular hemolyze. Okay, so we've got a diagnosis, but we know IMHA can be secondary to um, infectious diseases. So we would always look for Babesia. We'd always look for mycoplasma. Babesia more than mycoplasma, particularly with intravascular hemolysis, because um, mycoplasma is an epicellular parasite. It doesn't rupture the red cells, but Babesia 
ruptures the red cells when it replicates, causing intravascular hemolytic anemia. So now we're going to look at the white cells. So that's a neutrophorite. Then this is also, what is this? It's a neutrophil, and it's got this little indistinct uh, vacuolation in its uh, cytoplasm over there. And um, to me, it's looking a little toxic from here because there seems to be bluer than it should be. It's got maybe some discrete vacuolation. We see these discrete clear margin vacuoles in the cytoplasm. That could be that, an artifact, but when it's more indistinct, then it's definitely cytoplasmic vacuolation. Um, here's a band. I would definitely call this a band. Um, here's our beautiful Go cells. So she also has an inflammatory leukogram. So what do you guys think this is? That's what we call a smudgicite. So, or a basket cell. In other words, we don't know what it is. And it's not an intact cell, so who knows what it was in its past life. And this guy here looks to me like it's a lymphocyte. And here's a Hal Jolly body on there, which is kind of mimicking a Babesia gibsoni. And what's this cell here? That's a nucleated red blood cell. So you guys are pretty good with your, um, and you can see here that there's way too many leukocytes. But also our eye and the machine is going to count nucleated red blood cells as leukocytes, so you need to correct the count um, if you have a lot of nucleated reds. And she had 42, I think, nucleated reds per 100 whites, but she still ended up having a leukocytosis. And this cell here is, we'll just zoom in on it. And that cell here is, seems to be a totally different lineage from this cell. So what do you guys think this is? Pleomorphic nucleus. Pretty big cell. Monocyte. Great. So we have one more thing to do because we haven't been consistent. What's the last cell lineage we have to look at? Platelets. And what do you guys think? They're kind of a little low. So this dog was also thrombocytopenic. Um, actually, these hemolyzed red cells are, get counted falsely as platelets by analyzer, so that's an artifact that we look out for. And if necessary, we would cancel a count and give you an estimate from a smear, which is why learning how to estimate is really important. So she was just a typical IHA, well, not typical, but an intravascular hemolyzing IMHA with an inflammatory leukogram, which they often have. And she was also concurrently mildly thrombocytopenic, which they can concurrently be. Okay, so I think that's all I have time for. Took way too much longer on the preamble. I'll try and speed up this afternoon, but you do will have these slides to play with. As I said, you can download this um, software. It's gonna come up with an irritating sign in every time, just ignore it. Um, any questions? Okay, great, I'm sure you're all starving, so you can go for lunch. <laughs>